hey guys welcome back to our youtube channel it's a girl fanny longu back with another reaction video if you're new welcome if you're not welcome back so today i'm going to be reacting to Amit did that of course reasons with jews does palestine belong to jews part one of two this is something i'm interested in listening to because there's so many different opinions concerning this topic so without wasting time let's get into the video Ahmadidat, reasons with Jews, on Arab-Israel conflict. I says, Mr. Dear, have you seen the Quran? He says, no. I said, would you like to have a look at it? I said, Dear, have you got an English translation? I said, yes, sir. So I says, no, he says, I don't mind. So I had this same translation by Yusuf Ali, but it was in three volumes. You know, the paper was a bit rougher than this so you know it was very bulky so they divided into three parts ten separas each so I had it in three parts same Quran page for page same but very much bigger and bulkier so it was in three parts so between one couple I gave one part between the second couple I gave another part and the last volume I gave to my boss I said have a look sir so they opened the book it's natural inquisitive now so you just open the book and start looking so I suggested to my boss what I'm suggesting to you, my brothers and sisters, every night. Open the index. Look up the subject, Moses. If it was a Christian, I said, open the subject, Jesus. Look, he's a Jew. I said, open the subject, Moses. So he opened Moses. Beautiful references. Then I said, look, sir, why don't you look up exactly what it has to say? You know, these are only references. So he opened somewhere. He had a look. He opened somewhere else. I'm watching them. Then he looks up to me, he says, D Dad, this book is very funny. I said, What is funny about it, sir? He said, Look, D Dad, this book is speaking in our favor. See, but you people are all against us. So I said, It is true, sir. I said, You see, sir, the Egyptians, you know, set hard tasks for your people. They killed your sons and kept your daughters alive. In that was also a bitter sting. Why were they keeping your daughters alive? You knew why they were keeping them alive. And they said, hard task for you. Build, making bricks without straw and what and what not. They enslaved you. A free people that went there, they enslaved you. So, and you people were a people of God. Believed in God. Those were all idol worshippers, the Egyptians. So God Almighty is telling us that the Egyptians have been unjust to your people. But today, sir, I said, you see, you have usurped our lands. He says, Dad, how can you say that? Palestine belongs to us. <laughs> so I said, how, sir? How, sir? How does Palestine belong to you? And he knew his Bible better than many of us know our Quran. So he started quoting from the book of Genesis, chapter 17, verse 8. He says, and I will give unto thee, Allah bari ta'ala, speaking to Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam. Say, I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, that's Palestine, for an everlasting possession, and I will be the God. Means I will see to it that you are protected. Says, God Almighty promised it to us. And this is how they have programmed the Christian world. This is the promise of God to the Jews. If they go against the Jew, they are going against God. Can't you see? Like zombies, everybody is being led like zombies into this. So my boss, in good faith, is telling me, he said, look, Palestine belongs to us. God promised it to us. So I said, excuse me, sir. You see, the Bible gives us a test. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verses 21 and 22, we are told that, and if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? Suppose this was not given by God. Suppose God didn't utter those words about giving Palestine to Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam. How are we to know whether it was such a promise was made or it wasn't made? That the word Lord had not spoken. When a prophet speaketh, says the book of Deuteronomy, in the name of the Lord, in the name of God, if the thing follow not, if that thing doesn't happen, nor come to pass, that is the thing the Lord had not spoken. Because if Allah makes a promise, his promise is true, must come to pass. 
If the thing didn't happen, then that is the promise that was not made by Allah. But the Prophet had spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. Now they believe that a Prophet can speak presumptuously on his own. We believe that a Prophet can't do that. He's only a mouthpiece of God. Whatever Allah Ta'ala puts into his heart and mind, only that he can utter, not what he feels like. But according to the Christian Bible and the Jewish Bible, the prophets can speak, shoot it off, you know, off the cuff, anything what they like. So I said, look, this is a test. Is it a valid test? He said, of course it's a valid test. I said, let's apply it. Let us apply to this prophecy. It's a prophecy that Ibrahim was going to get the whole of Palestine, Canaan, for an everlasting position, him and his children. So I said, you see, sir, the day when Abraham died, it says in Genesis chapter 25, verses 9 and 10, and his sons, Isaac and Ishmael, buried him in a cave. Buried Hazrat Ibrahim in a cave. The field which Abraham purchased of the sons of Heth. There was Abraham buried. There was Abraham buried and Sarah, his wife. They were buried in the same place. What land? What he had purchased with hard cash. He got nothing for nothing. He paid for it, according to the Bible, your book. So in other words, he had nothing. And we are told that he didn't have enough land to rest his foot upon. Not one square foot of land he owned. What was given to him for nothing. This is what he had to buy with his sweated labor. Then in the book of Hebrews, for the Christians now, chapter 11, verse 13, these Hebrews, you know who? Again, Paul. Well, we, we use him. This Paul says, these all died in faith. All these prophets, you know, were given promises. Allah, you know, promised them the golden carrot dangled before them. He said, these all died in faith, not having received the promises. Not having received. They didn't receive it. Allah was dangling this carrot before them, like a donkey. You know, come, come, come. And they were being led. This is what Paul is telling us. But having seen them afar off, you see that golden carrot, donkey, far, far, you keep on going for it, they receive nothing. So I said, now, is it true, sir? Is it true that they didn't receive the promises? They got nothing. He got nothing. He was supposed to get the whole of Palestine for an everlasting possession, and he didn't own, not one square foot of land was given to him. Is it true? So, well, his book says so. So I said, therefore, this promise could not be of God. And the battle was over. A sincere man. Since Allah says, Min humul mu'minuna, among them there are good people, walk through humul fasikun. The majority of them are perverted transgressors. But there are good people. He said, no, I can see the point. He's my boss. But I didn't want to cut short the discussion. We wanted to pursue this further. So I said, you see, Mr. Beer, I am prepared to concede that God did make such a promise. As if Palestine belonged was my father's property. I'm prepared to give it to you, in other words. So I said, now, the prophecy is, I will give unto thee, means Abraham, and to thy seed after thee. I said, who is the seed of Abraham? She said, we, the Jews. I said, no, no, no doubt. You are the seed of Abraham, but are you the only seed? I said, you know, in the book of Genesis, the first book of your Torah, no less than 12 places, Ishmael, that's how they say it. Ishmael is described as the son and seed of Abraham, no less than 12 times. And as for Ishmael, thy son, and as for Ishmael, thy seed, it says 12 princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation, because he is thy seed, no less than 12 times. So, I said, you see, sir, you know, you are the seed of Abraham, and the Arabs are also the seed of Abraham. Why can't you both live in peace and harmony as brothers? Instead of you lording it over them and kicking them out. He says, D that. You see, we had this country. You know, we possessed it under David and Solomon. So they are entitled to it. So he said, How did you get it, sir? You see, you went came out of Egypt, twelve tribes, united people. Under Joshua, united people. And you go into a village. Their village chieftain, you know, they call them kings. You know, a little fellow with 500 people or 200 people living there in the village is a little king, like the Bantus they have, you know, in Kosi, in Kosi, in Kosi, everywhere, a little, little in Kosi. So they had these Palestinians, these Palestinians, they also had the little, little chiefs. 
So they went and knocked over one king, conquered him. Yeah, you are tribes, united tribes, 12 tribes against one little fellow there. And in one day they killed 30 kings. Can you imagine? They conquered 30 different countries. Can you imagine? No, what they did was one village, another village, another village, they knocked hells into them. They, they didn't know that they were a nation. This guy is thinking his village is his country. He is not thinking that, look, those guys are coming along, let us unite and defend ourselves. No, 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 this is mine, he lost it. That guy thinks this is mine and he lost it. And they lost 30 countries in one day. 30 kings, they killed the Jews. They killed 30 Jews. So I said, look, you knocked hells into the people because the people, they didn't know that they were a people. They didn't know that they were a nation. There's only one little shift and another little shift and you knock them over and you took the land by force. I said, if that entitles you to that country because your forefathers, David and Solomon, had it, then we would be entitled to, e, uh, for, to Spain. I said, you know, my forefathers ruled Spain for 800 years. 800 years, the Muslims, and we have to go today and see the, the monuments that my forefathers built. They're still there. If we had the power, can we go and reclaim Spain? He said, look, who built the Alhambra? You built it? My forefathers built it, so we're going to claim it. I said, the Dutch, can they go back to Indonesia? He said, look, our forefathers ruled it for 300 years. The Portuguese, can they come back to Mozambique? They said, look, our forefathers ruled it for 500 years. Nonsense. But he says, D, Dad, we have it. It belongs to us. You know, we got it now. I said, right, how did you get it? Might is right. Is that is your principle? That by force of arms you took it away from the poor Arabs? If that entitles you to Palestine, then they have a right to take it back by force. Why are you complaining? If by force, if you are entitled, if justifies you taking away, possessing somebody else's property, then by force of arms they can reclaim it. What are you crying about? And the discussion went on for an hour. And this boss of mine with the other Jews, you know, they had sins. They're good-hearted people. Among them, Allah says. So he says, you know, did that we didn't know that the Arabs had a case. This is his confession. We didn't know. In other words, they program from childhood into believing that this is ours. This is ours. Emotionally, this is ours. So anybody wants to defend his property, say, no, you have no right. You are, bar you are barbarians. You are thieves and brigands. You have stolen our land. So we have a right to repossess it. He says, did that. I want you to write this. And I will publish this in my Temple David magazine. It's a new synagogue of the reformed Jews in Durban. He was the editor of this Temple David magazine. He said, look, you write what you are telling. You write, and I will publish it for you. I said, Mr. Beer, you know, I can't write. And really, you know, the writing is very difficult for me. Talking is very easy. I like to talk. But writing... What a burden it is, I know. So I said, he said, no, no, read that. You write as you speak, and I will improve it for you. I know he meant well, but we never came to that. What do you think happened the next day, from there on, in the firm? You expect me to be fired, no? No. From the day onwards, I have become Mr. d -Dat. <laughs> Previously, it's D-Dat, D-Dat. Now says, Mr. D. He comes in the morning and says, good morning, Mr. D-Dad. He goes for lunch and says, good afternoon, Mr. D-Dad. Good evening, Mr. D-Dad. D-Dad becomes Mr. D-Dad. Promotion. <laughs> so in the firm, the other Jewish managers, this is the boss comes and tells him, say, you know, this guy here, dispatch clerk. Dispatch clerk is a lowly job in a white firm. Say, you know, this guy here, man, he made rings around us. Story continues in part two. Like, share, and subscribe to create awareness. We are also available on Facebook, Google+, Twitter, and Pal Talk. A uh, very interesting take on the situation, but if someone can claim that my ancestors conquered and ruled this country for 400 years. What about the people that lived before your people came to conquer that land? Should they also claim that well, the original people of this land? I feel like many of us have been programmed in this world to believe a lot of things. A lot of things that 
we've been conditioned conditioned to see things through someone else's eye than the original story it's like the story has been twisted how are you going to come all the way maybe from europe to claim a land that's far away that one has never made sense and i'm glad now we're learning about such things in school so we get to think for ourselves why is someone claiming imagine people uniting and killing 30 kings and that's okay to you is that the history that you want to be proud of i mean maybe it was normal back then to conquer people in such a way but now we're frowning upon such acts it's sad that someone had to die for you to claim that land as your own how do you chase people away from their land they've been there for years they've honestly been there for years and you come out of nowhere because someone told you that's your promised land because you feel like by right by nature it's your land but those people have been there for years so how do you make such a claim is what i always find fascinating about this topic and it doesn't make sense because despite everything all the talks they've had for this uh, particular country i don't think there's much that has been solved and look at the map we were given from 1940 something to a map in 20 or something 2010 and look at the difference of how those people have been like the communities have been minimized while you occupied the entire land and now you occupy next to nothing which is very very unfair I mean many of us if I, and I don't even think the world would want many people to claim their lands back because that's going to cause com commotion many people are going to claim a lot of land that's just going to be insane I mean let me know what you guys think especially those people that are studying politics political science international relations your um your thoughts are always welcome if there's anything you want me to react to let me know by dropping the name on the link down below i'll be more than glad to react to it make sure to give this video a thumbs up share it with your friends and of course do not forget to subscribe and i'll see you in my next reaction video